So we're about to embark on some full text annotation. You should have some pages sitting in front of you um, of a very short passage, um, which uh, Tiago has uh, kindly translated into Portuguese. Um, now, everything I'm going to say about this is based on the English. My relatively limited Portuguese tells me that as far as I can tell, the things I'm saying about English also apply to Portuguese. But, you know, again, be, beware, that might not be true. Um, translation is a tricky business. Okay, um, so first of all, uh, just to emphasize, even if it doesn't come up in this exercise, because I've actually chosen a passage which is really simple. I've made it as simple as it possibly can be. I looked at a lot of stuff. Um, and nevertheless, a lot of the stuff that we talked about today is going to come up. However, if you look at anything more complicated, pretty much everything we talked about will come up, even in one text. Okay? So it really doesn't take very long to get complicated. So I'm, I'm trying to give you something not too terrible, not too terrifying um, for the, your first um, but just keep in mind, it only is worse from here. So um, we're going to need to go through a couple of other things in the course uh, of what we're talking about. And I'm going to review uh, Miriam's slides on full text annotation just to remind people of what it's about. Um, so full text annotation. Um, lets us uh, talk about how frame semantics contributes to text understanding. So once you have done your full text annotation, this represents a model of the, an actual semantic model of all of the information which is in your document. Of course, it has to be com combined with named entity recognition, you know, for proper names and companies and all these things. Of course, it has to be combined with kinds of information which are not in FrameNet, but it constitutes a, a model that l does let you connect together what's in the document. And it's also been demonstrated to be useful for that purpose uh, computationally. Um, so the way that it actually works is uh, before the annotators even see the text, we run a named entity recognition on it. It's just an automated process. And it finds all the proper names, or it tries to, it screws it up sometimes. It's an automated process. It goes without saying. Um, also, part of speech is tagged, and that's actually important um, for um, the workflow that I'm going to discuss. Um, so after the text is in the database, then the annotators have to identify which words in the text should be annotated by frame netters, because not every word is going to be annotated. I mean, we're not going to annotate the. We're not going to uh, annotate uh, the verb to be separately from its use as a support. So it'll be annotated in the annotation of another word, but its own annotation, it will not have. Okay? So some words don't get annotated, and that's all perfectly good. Um, then, once we've identified which words we're supposed to annotate, then we have to figure out, well, what frames apply to them. And then, once we've done that, then we enter the lexicographic process that we've talked about before with the additional complication that we cannot choose to just skip this one. Okay? So, here's what the product looks like. You can see that uh, there's, here's the whole paragraph. Named entities are identified as things that aren't our problem. They're not for us to worry about. And you see that um, many other words are in italics. All the words that are in italics are words that we don't even think we're supposed to worry about. And those are identified by part of speech and also by some tagging that we have to do manually. Everything which is not in italics is stuff that we consider to be our job. 
Miriam has a question. A microphone to the back, please. Or a comment. Can you give an example of a word that's italicized? Because I don't think we can see ah. that from here. Um, okay. So or at least or at least the category of such words. Yep. So, uh, for example, uh, by the way, I will point out that not all of the words which are italicized here are supposed to be italicized. Um, and I'll go through that in more detail. This is a part of our process that we don't always do perfectly. Um, here you can see that the very first word, Iran, which is in yellow because it's been recognized as a named entity, is italicized, right? And the apostrophe S, which in our process makes a separate corpus position, is also italicized. Iran is italicized because it was recognized as a named entity. The apostrophe S is italicized because it recognized that it's a part of speech that we know we're not worried about. We're in, FrameNet is not going to have a separate target apostrophe S. Okay, Miriam? So would you say that what's, I, I, I cannot see uh -huh. what's there. So uh, would you say that what's italicized uh, is uh, those parts of speech for which FrameNet is not going to do anything? That's correct. Is that? Well, that's our goal. No, the, the words that are actually italicized here, some of them are incorrectly italicized. Right. So, so uh, let, me, let me point out one example. If you, look, um, if you look down, you can see that there's the adverb steadily. It's on the second to last line towards the middle. So Iran's nuclear program steadily grew. Steadily there is actually italicized because the automatic process thinks that we don't want to annotate adverbs. However, we, we, we know we that steadily is a meaningful word that evokes a real frame. It would be interesting for us to do. So this is a place where we leaned on the automated process and we haven't corrected it yet. So it's, um, what's italicized is uh, every, if the, if the uh, automated uh, process worked 100% correctly, italicized means this is not our job. This is not our job and it's not our job because it's a part of speech that we are not worrying about. Part of speech or something semantically completely uninteresting. Oh, like, okay. a, like a proper name. There are no frame elements to a proper name. Right. So that's what I meant by categories. Yep. Right. So, so those are the two categories. It's and if it's a named entity, then it gets yellow highlighted. As well as italicized. Right. Italics means we're not going to worry about yep. it. Those things that we're not worrying about are either named entities, in which case it gets yellow highlighting, or a part of speech that we're not doing anything about. Uh, or in rare cases, there are nouns that we're just dead certain are completely well handled by WordNet. And we would have nothing extra to say about them. So a noun like, let's just say, rock. There's no frame elements to, to rock. Not, not interesting ones. They're the, if there are frame elements, they're the same ones that apply to entity. We already have the entity frame. We just really don't need to go into any more detail about all the entities that are, there are in the world for frame net purposes. Because Anybody who seriously wants to, to use our resource for nat natural language processing will also be using WordNet. They would have to be. And so it makes no sense for us to do double coverage or sort of try to get credit for something that we're not adding anything to. Okay? So um, just, just to say, it's an imperfect process, but the, the idea is clear. Some things we should annotate some things are not useful for us to annotate. Um, each of the, the things which are in blue are actually targets. The frame is indicated uh, below them in this interface. And you can click on those targets to actually see the annotation that's attached. 
and that's what we have in the first sentence uh, on, that's in the bottom panel. You can see Iran's interest in nuclear technology is annotated with respect to the adjective, uh, sorry, the noun interest. Okay? All right, so enough about like what it actually is. How do we do it? So here you have, uh, this is the same as the text which is sitting in front of you, although without the translation. The first thing I want you guys to do is to figure out uh, what are the targets. Which things you think FrameNet would have something interesting and useful to say about? Or if you think it's easier, indicate the things that it wouldn't be interesting. You know, just to indicate somehow which ones would be interesting for FrameNet, which ones wouldn't be. And then we'll compare to what I recommend. Okay? So we're going to spend just five minutes which hopefully is enough time. Okay? Okay. Uh, I'm going to ignore the pleas of the unfortunate uh, because they are so few. Um, and uh, it's okay. If you're not done, that's totally fine. Uh, you will be continuing this after class. And so don't worry. Okay? I will be giving you this much of the answer in class but probably everybody's going to have to change what they have written down, I think, uh, including myself probably. So uh, let's take a look at what I think you should annotate. So everything, everything which is in bold here, which might be hard to see, but we'll go through it in detail, um, are things which I think that at the very least potentially FrameNet should handle. Okay? So the first one is have. Probably everybody recognized that have, have was important and have would be useful for us to annotate. I definitely saw as I was walking around that not everybody indicated that in should be annotated. But it should. Because you wouldn't know what the heck the sentence was actually about if you didn't know what in meant and how it contributed to the sentence. It has the advantage also of being a preposition, and so it's super easy to annotate. So, you know, even though you have to annotate it, it's really not difficult. Except for perhaps choosing the frame. We'll get to that in a minute. Um, okay, pocket. This one is debatable. The reason why we consider that pocket is interesting is because exactly as you see here, you can see that it has a frame element. So pockets usually aren't independent, it's just sitting out there walking around in the world by themselves. They're associated both with a clothing item, so they have a frame element for that, and they're associated with whoever's wearing the clothing. Okay? There's other frame elements too, but those are particular and special for pocket and not, not the sorts of frame elements that you would find for rock. Okay? That's why I say it's debatable because pocket certainly is in WordNet and it certainly would tell you that it's a part of clothing that much, but it wouldn't tell you how to do the frame elements. Manuscript, also debatable. I imagine not everybody indicated that one. Um, I can tell you that not only uh, do I think that we should annotate this one, we actually do have the right frame in FrameNet already for this. Reason why is because manuscripts as texts evoke language. And the evoking of language gives them a whole set of other frame elements. So I can have a manuscript about the atomic bomb, right? And I really, really would be missing something if I had a phrase like the, a manuscript about the atomic bomb and I couldn't connect up the relationship of atomic bomb to the manuscript and to the rest of the sentence, right? 
an even more debatable case. Well, said, I think everybody, I'm sure everybody indicated that said is supposed to be annotated. Okay, moving on. Doctor. Highly debatable. However, you should notice that this is exactly the structure that we were talking about before with a pseudo-positive where doctor, especially abbreviated like this, has to have something associated with it. So if you say dr period, then there must be uh, a name afterwards. That really seems like it's sort of crying out for a frame element analysis. Okay? So that's why we would annotate doctor. I'm sure no one is surprised that James Mortimer is not something we're supposed to annotate. Okay, I think we're probably all in agreement. We don't need to have a frame for James Mortimer. Okay, great. Observed, I think, is pretty obvious. Probably everybody did that one. As is less obvious, but is totally necessary for understanding the sentence. It's the thing that links up the big chunk on one side of the sentence to the chunk on the other side. Okay? That's less straightforward to annotate, but would really help a lot to see how the whole sentence hangs together. Okay? So um, now I'm going to make this briefer by asking if anybody has questions about what I have up here and what I don't. So does anybody have anything that they think should be a target that I have not put in bold here? Nobody. Okay. Yeah, I'm extremely permissive about what I think should be a target. I think almost everything should be a target, in fact. So that's not too surprising. Uh, is there anything else that people uh, would question, would say maybe, maybe I shouldn't have it as a target? And this is a, a trick question because there's one thing up here which I made as an intentional mistake. Uh, Michael, yeah. Uh, as well, my I cannot see very well from here, but it, it seems that the pronouns like I and you mm -hmm. are not potential targets, correct? In according to this, yeah. Yeah, but uh, for me they would be. Okay. Because they at some point uh, create a I don't know Dates's frame or mm -hmm. something like that. Yeah, I think the, the simplest thing to say about that is that um, we don't have any ability to say anything meaningful uh, about that frame and how it hooks things together. Mm -hmm. I certainly think that um, basically this is a question of do, do you draw a line between pragmatics and semantics? If I draw a line, it's a very shaky one. Mm -hmm. um, and um, But in this particular case, I don't think, basically each pronoun would fill a different frame element in that frame, and that's one, one way you could talk about it, mm -hmm. right? You could have the first person, uh, you know, uh, frame element. Mm -hmm. However, uh, that's not going to tell you how to do uh, embeddings or any of these other things. So if I have something like, um, give me the, the pencil, Holmes said, mm -hmm then, you know, how do I identify that the I is Holmes and all this stuff. We have ways of doing this, and certainly I would propose a mental spaces analysis or something like that. Mm -hmm. um, you know, but I don't think FrameNet would contribute a lot to that analysis, because I think those analyses are actually adequate as they stand. Okay, okay. Yeah. Uh, okay, has anybody come up with something that what, what would you say is the most debatable thing which is still up here? Michael, I okay. have a question. 
I can't tell if it's in bold or not, so I'm going to ask. Yeah. Is the word or the um, uh, abbreviation for doctor in mm -hmm. bold? Yeah. I did that on purpose. Yeah, so I would ask about that. Yeah, as I said earlier, that one is debatable. Uh, although it certainly has a construction element, at the least. Oh. Mm -hmm. uh, and so it is interesting from that viewpoint. It's an amazingly simple frame mm. with only one, and all the lexical units in it have only one valence, mm. right? They're always, you know, immediately followed by a proper name. And really, you can't do anything about that. It's very, mm. very straightforward. So it's not that interesting from a frame net perspective, but, but we do have is, something to yeah, say about it. Okay. <clears throat> okay, the the I think I'm going to point to somebody at this point. Uh, how about uh, can you give the microphone to the uh, lady in the back right there? Yes? You Yep. Okay. So, um, what would you say is the most debatable thing that I have left? You, you don't have to, to say that it's, it's wrong. Just say, what, what, what would you question the most out of what I have left? No sleep. <laughs> okay. Uh, pass the microphone to your right. I don't know very well, but I would say sir. Sir is in bold, isn't it? Okay. It is. is isn't it, is. it the same case of the doctor? Is it, I don't know. I, I would say sir is debatable. Sir is very debatable. And one of the reasons why I wanted to point it out is because we actually do annotate it in FrameNet. Yeah. But I think that's wrong. <laughs> <laughs> so this is, uh, this is to point out that it's not the case that I think we've done everything right in FrameNet. So sir is in bold, yes. Um, but there are no frame elements. Mm -hmm. You know, is, this thing is usable only as a direct address. There's never going to be any syntactic dependent to this thing. So it's pretty uninteresting from that perspective. Although, as in the case of pronouns, as Tiago was talking about, you, you can understand uh, a frame that this participates in. Um, you know, that's one way of looking at it. But it, it's no more useful to treat sir than it is to treat you. Because sir is basically a form of you. Okay, thanks. Good job. All right. So. Those are at least the targets that I would propose. <coughs> Miriam has a comment. I have a question. OK. Um, so I actually don't remember what uh, the motivation for annotating SIR was at the time that FrameNet decided to annotate SIR. And I think it might be uh, at least interesting and maybe even useful to um, describe the motivation at the time. OK. Uh, I, um, I can describe that in detail because uh, it's in part my fault. Um, part of the motivation is that, um, let's say we take uh, a word like, ouch. OK, so there's a, you know, you can say ouch. And there's not going to be any frame elements to ouch. But it would seem kind of weird to not relate it in some way to the frame that has hurt in it, right? So somehow, you know, I can, uh, I can say that basically ouch is saying something about the speaker, whoever they are, either feels direct pain as a result of something, or they feel metaphorical pain, or they're feeling sympathetic pain for somebody else. Right, so it should in some way be related to a pain frame. That's fair. And in fact, there are some cases like, sorry, 
that alternate between having real frame elements. So I'm sorry that class started late, right? And all the frame elements of the scene are there. Or I can just say, ooh, sorry. And that second case looks a lot like definite null instantiation. But it's not clear as to whether that's going on. And do you want to say that ouch is a member of the uh, experience bodily harm frame, but with all the frame elements obligatorily null instantiated? That's debatable. But then, basically, cases like the vocative are what I would call mission creep from that. In other words, once we get the idea that maybe we want to relate these pragmatically grounded words, words that are grounded in the discourse context, back to a related frame, then we, I think we got a little over-enthusiastic in this case. I actually would still defend ouch. I think ouch does go in a bodily harm frame with exactly the requirement that the experiencer is bound to the speaker. And that's a good way to handle it. But this case is much more debatable. But this is the reason why we spend a long time debating these things, because the cases are not always completely clear. OK? All right. So moving on, those are our targets. Before I go any further, I just want to say we really need to, we, we have to pay a lot of attention to this process of figuring out what our targets are pretty early in the process. And the reason why is because, you know, we, we want to be able to do things efficiently. And many of the ways of doing things efficiently assume, let's say, for example, I have a big text. And it has, it's a tourism text. And it's in it. 20 times. Probably each of those uses of visit is the same. It would be very efficient to be able to handle all of those at the same time and annotate them all together, one after the other, and not have to switch gears. But the only way that it's really easy to do that is if the list of all the words of the document really is only the words that we need to annotate. Otherwise, it has the word the, it has the word, you know, of, it has all these other things that are just distractors and make the, the whole process completely unwieldy. So for computational reasons, we actually need to keep track of this. So we actually have a, a way of uh, indicating this independently of part of speech and independently of name entity recognition because sometimes those are wrong, and then we have to change those. And also sometimes there's a word like sir that we shouldn't annotate, even though the part of speech isn't bad, and even though it's not a named entity. We need a way to indicate, oh, this is not for us to annotate. And the way we do that is we actually have a tag on the word status layer. It's the only tag in, in that layer, and we just put it on there. And that lets us have a, an efficient process. Because then the computer knows that we're not worried about it. And that lets us know how much have we actually finished, which is also nice. OK. So in the next couple of pages, and I'm going to post these, these two pages um, just in case people um, are limited in how they know how to use the FrameNet uh, website. They shouldn't be, but this is my going through all the targets that I had marked and finding what frames it, they could participate in. So this is the same, if you remember, this is the same as if you go to the FrameNet website and you look up the lemma of have, and then it's going to tell you what frames it could be in. In some cases, I've actually narrowed it down a little bit. 
uh, because there were multi-words, especially for things like in. Uh, there's already enough frames there for you to worry about. Um, so I have eliminated all of the multi-words involving in because in participates in lots of idioms that we have independently covered in, in FrameMan. And I just killed those because none of those idioms are what's involved here. Although in my pocket is separately an idiom that we don't have in FrameNet. That's not what this one means. Okay, so I'm not going to go over this in detail. This is just reporting what is there in the FrameNet database right now. But I will say this. There's no guarantee that the frames that you have here will cover the example that you have. So we could have a ton of frames, but they could all be wrong. That's probably the hardest thing in full text annotation and the thing that people most often screw up from a really important perspective. They also screw up other things, grammatical function, phrase type, other stuff. But the thing that really bothers me or worries me about our annotation is when people annotate things in the wrong frame because they didn't realize they needed to make a new frame or that at least somebody needs to make a new frame. Yeah. Okay. Um, you might have said it when I stepped out, but what does BIS stand for? Which thing? Twice. Oh, this twice. I'm sorry. It means twice. Two times. It occurs two times in the text. Oh, two times in the text. Yep. Okay. And I think I forgot to to say that um, on say. Yeah, say is actually more than twice, but I forgot to fix that. Um, yep. Um, I thought that was actually, is that a word of Portuguese or you don't use it? Yes, we do. Oh, okay. Yeah, okay. But you know, in a, in a word of acronyms like FrameNet, people... Sure. Yep, infer, absolutely. You know? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, I did just mean twice. That's all I meant. Uh, so I didn't list, I didn't list the target in both places. I mean, these are listed in order that they appear in the text, except that some words appear multiple times. Okay. Um, okay. So now I'm going to spend a little while talking about how are the FrameNet desktop interface for full text actually works. So here you see uh, kind of probably not very possible to see what's going on here, unfortunately. But I'll point at some things just to let you know in general how it works. Um, I didn't know you could do that. Awesome. Um, OK, um, so uh, you can see at the top that there's uh, a, the sentence listed without any interruption. It just says, yet the best the far left could do was not enough to deter the biggest vote nearly 40% from endorsing the direction Spain is taking. Okay? So that's just, you know, the sentence. Uh, but it is helpful because when you're down here looking at this line, then you're scrolling back and forth on that, but there's not very much you can see because you have to be able to annotate it, which means it has to be expanded out. You can't wrap lots of other things. So it's useful to be able to see the sentence written above to know where the heck you are in this great big thing. So here you can see um, the, the best the far left could do. And uh, sorry, could you scroll to the right slightly? Here you see that the very first target, which actually has its own label, is enough. We scroll to the left, and we see that the um, frame for enough is uh, sufficiency. Actually, you just have to scroll all the way to the left to see that. Um, so here you see the frame name, and there's the target name, enough.a. And all of these layers belong to that annotation set. 
So uh, also I'll point out that you can see here that there's a named entity recognition layer and the word status layer. So the, um, the first frame element here, you have item external NP. This is very straightforward, right? I mean, the only thing is that you do have to use the fact that enough uh, is, is an adjective in this use. And so then you see, ah, uh, it's an adjective. It's used predicatively. That means I mark this thing as external, just like if it were a verb. Um, but then you also see that it has a further complement. And as in the general case, um, complements usually have the grammatical function dependent, and this one has the phrase type pp2, right? So anyway, you see that this breaks down into the kind of annotation you already know how to do. You just have to first identify what the heck it is that you're supposed to be annotating, and then identify what is the frame for this instance. Then, once you've done that, you can see what the frame elements are. You use your general ideas about how it is you annotate different parts of speech, and then you can go on. Okay, I actually don't think I need to show a lot more detail on this slide. Oops, that's not what I meant to do. There we go. Um, I keep hitting the wrong button, sorry. Um, just to point out that you know all of these layers are different targets, and actually there's quite a lot more underneath this in order to annotate a whole sentence that's as long as that one. I mean, this is not a super long sentence, but it's long enough to have something like 15 targets in it. Then you end up with a lot of layers. Once you've finished all of this, then you actually have a model of the sentence, as I was saying before. And I'm going to come back to this exact sentence later on because we have ways of automatically processing this to really produce a graph that has all of this stuff together. Uh, and I'll be showing that later on when we go into the NLP part uh, of the program. Okay. Okay. So when you look at that, that interface, one thing that makes it a lot easier is that, just to go back, you see this uh, line here up at the top that includes the sentence? When we right click on that line, on top of any word, it will then list all of the possible frames for addition. So, for example, if I clicked on biggest, it would give me all of the frames that big is in. So size, importance, and other things. Okay? So that makes it very, very easy, the fact that, that that part of the process is automatic. You do have to know what the frames mean, or if you don't, you have to look them up. That's slow, but it's as slow as it has to be. Then, you know, after you, you automatically have narrowed down the choices to only those frames that are uh, going to be useful for annotating this target, you choose the right one. But be aware that the right one might not be in the list. It's very, this makes it very easy to just pick one which is there because you think, ah, I need to annotate this. And then you just think of which is the best match, not if, you know, the right match isn't there at all. Okay. And when no LU is right for you, you can be very sad. Because there's sort of an indefinite possible amount of work that might be necessary for that. If you're lucky, you can think of some synonyms or antonyms, and you can find a frame that's already there that you can just add the word to. That's not hard. That's actually a very quick process in, in our system. Um, you know, you have to think of a definition, things like this, but that's, it's not difficult. However, a lot of the times what happens is you don't find it anywhere. 
then you should use the fact that FrameNet is a net. You find some related word that is in FrameNet. You start thinking, you know, well, you know, if they don't have this, maybe they have this other thing. Then, once you've done that, which is not an easy process, once you find some frame that's related, then you can really confirm whether or not the word is there. Because then you can, well, sorry, whether the frame is there. Because then you can look at all of the frames that are related to the frame that you find and see if any of them are right. And if none of them are, that's okay because the amount of work that you have to do for that, you would have to do in order to create the new frame. You might want to create the new frame. However, you probably understand by now that making a new frame is a lot of work. Really a lot of work to make a new frame. Which is why we only have something like a thousand frames. If it were easy, we've been going for more than 10 years, we would have a lot more. Um, so, Michael, that, what's that? FrameNet has actually been going now for 15 years. 15. That's true, yeah. One, five. Long time. Um, yeah, so we would have more frames if it were easy to do, but it's not. Um, so at this point, probably this is where you kick it up the food chain and you ask your supervisor whether you're actually supposed to make this frame and spend uh, probably half a week on that, or are you supposed to annotate the next word, which will take you a few seconds. So that does make it a difficult choice. Um, here, and I might need some magnification again, uh, here you can see um, a tool that actually makes the workflow very, very easy. So if you look, oops, wrong one. Uh, if you look in the middle here, you can see that here is the, the word demand. And you can see that actually there's only one possible frame in FrameNet right now for that word. If you click on this number one, this will take you to the one place in the document where that word occurs. You can see that the, um, the numbers are actually how many are actually filling that category. So. What that means, sorry, uh, is that demand occurs once in the document and is annotated once in the request frame. As opposed to here, where you have deal, the verb, and it's annotated zero times with speak on topic and one time with resolve problem. Eddie. I mean, I feel frightened now because in the World Cup project, we need to create about uh, more or less 30, 40 frames. And I know if we, we, we will have some days, raining days, to create <laughs> such frames. Uh, is it so difficult, so difficult. Because besides the natural difficult, it is a specific domain. Mm -hmm. um, what I would say is that it's being a specific domain actually makes it easier. The really difficult frames are the ones like for words like leave. Okay. Like, leave participates in a lot of things. It's used metaphorically a whole lot. And for each case where it's metaphorical, you have to decide, is it a two separate frames metaphor, or is this annotated inside the same frame? You know, it's the highly polysemous, highly 
you know, the frames that have a lot of polysimus items in them that eat up the time because you, to draw a boundary between two frames where there's a lot of words that go back and forth can be very, very difficult. Uh, whereas if the, as the vocabulary gets more specific, it's actually easier. So, uh, you know, if you have something like soccer ball, then only a, you know, it's always a soccer ball. Um, and if you have uh, something like um, higher, there are two meanings, but at least there's only two, right? One of them is a British sense to, to rent. And the other one is to uh, have an employee start. And those two <coughs> frames are not too entangled. So that's actually way easier. Miriam? So I was going to say that um, once you understand the methodology given the theory on which it's based, the work is not difficult, but to get it right is time consuming. Yep. And I'm, I'm absolute, the half week estimate is an absolute underestimate for things like the possession frame. Uh, there was a lot of work that went into that. Um, the family of frames about persuasion I think we collectively probably spent half a year. You know, I mean, if you just took all of the time of all the people, it, it probably would add up to a person year or something like that on that frame, maybe two or three frames. Um, and that's as opposed to lots of other frames where we, we made it, it took a day or something like that. It's fine. Um, so the variability is high. Um, and it really depends. You, you can get some sense for how terrible the process will be after you have some experience. But I will say this, it has always seemed to be more difficult than we thought it would be in every case. Uh, so the easy cases are easier than, than the hard ones. But you think, oh, this will just take, like, I can do this in 10 minutes. And then you start on it, and it doesn't work that way. Uh, and the hard cases, you say, well, it's difficult. It'll probably take me all week. And then, you know, yeah. So at any rate, um, it's very dependent on what, what you want from the process. And uh, I'll just say this. Whenever you decide to make a frame, you need to decide whether you need that frame. Whatever it is, that, whatever task you're trying to do, there's something that you want in the end. You need to look at that before you start making a frame. Instead, instead of just saying, oh, I'll just make it, uh, because the, that, uh, that idea usually doesn't work out. Yeah. Okay. Oops. Okay. So the full text vanguarding tool that I just showed you, it really lets us keep track of progress. So if our goal is to have complete coverage of our text, which is the goal that we've usually adopted in, in FrameNet, then you know if you, if you look at that, you can see which things are not annotated that we should annotate. It lets us annotate all of a word at once, like I was saying before. Uh, so if you have receive in your document, and it occurs a bunch of times, uh, if it's in a soccer domain, then probably it's all about passing the ball. Uh, and so it's all going to be in one frame. So it doesn't make any sense to try to make the decision about which frame it belongs to many, many times, right? You really just make it once, annotate them all together, and you're done. Um, and you really can hit a rhythm doing that. It also gives us multiple viewpoints on the work process, both for annotation and for frame creation. Because if I see, as I go through the, the document, if I see that there are five frames for this word, and they all have little zeros next to them, as in this word has not been assigned in this text to any of these. Well, first I check and I see, well, maybe somebody just didn't annotate it. But then if I go through and I see, oh, no one annotated it because there's no frame for any of these. Then I can see, well, I need to make a new frame. It occurs five times in my text. It's frequent enough uh, that I should 
do that. Okay? All right. I'm just going to step back slightly and go back to, to the question, why, why do we want to annotate full text? And there's a lot of reasons why you might want to. One of the reasons, is, which is really important for natural language processing, is because it gives you an idea of the frequency. So anything that does anything in natural language processing requires some kind of probabilistic model. And the probabilistic model is going to work terribly if it has the wrong frequency for training as opposed to the real world. This is why, one of the reasons why, the automatic semantic role labeling that I will be talking about later on in this course has such difficulty because most of the training data is lexicographic annotation, which doesn't even intend to represent the frequency of the different valences, of the different targets, of anything. And with the, you know, they have to, in a way, pretend that this is frequency data, but this has effects on the output of these processes that are not so great. So one thing that's nice about full text data is it sort of gives what you can call ecological validity. Right, so if something occurs very frequently, we probably have a frame for it if we've been doing full text annotation. And if a particular pattern occurs very frequently, we represent that many times so that you can actually train your process on the actual frequency. Or at least the estimate that you would get from our texts, which is the best that you will ever get from any probabilistic estimate over language. It also can give you a semantic model of a whole document. So for many people, that's a very uh, attractive proposition. So for many of the purposes that people want FrameNet for, they, they want it for that. That's their, their end goal. So for example, if I'm running a call center, and I want to automatically process as many calls as I can before it gets to a human that I have to pay some kind of terrible wage and give health care and all these other things, you know, at least in the U.S. Um, then uh, the, you know, it pays for me to be able to understand what's been going on in the discourse. And having something like this, this isn't, you know, there, some people are investigating FrameNet for that purpose, to try to be able to understand, you know, when the caller says, I really just need to talk to an operator now. Look, this is not going to work. It would be very useful to just go ahead and direct the call at that point, because either it's true or the person is uncooperative. Either way, they should go to the, op the operator. Um, and the only thing that will be accomplished by keeping them on the line is making them mad. So for, for purposes like that, it's very important. And for many other things, including semantic search. So if I want to find the answer to a question, as was done with the, the Watson computer, uh, I happen to know there is some frame net in there, for sure. Um, and part of what they are using that for is to automatically annotate Wikipedia to be able to identify the answer to the question. So this is a very useful aspect of things. And whether you do it by hand or automatically, you would like to be able to do that. A third point, which is nearest and dearest to my heart, is that it really forces us to, to confront difficult cases. So as long as we're doing lexicographic annotation, we're intentionally avoiding the borderline cases, the difficult cases. But when we do this, well, we're annotating everything. So we do the difficult cases, and it teaches us how. And it stretches our theory. And since everybody at Berkeley FrameNet is a total construction grammarian type, we really believe that what we're supposed to describe as linguists 
is any language, any kind at all. So we don't believe in a, a principled division between core grammar, non-core grammar, or division between proper language and improper, you know. So we think that this, this really helps us to, to keep honest, in a way, um, and handle real language and figure out how to do it. Okay. For tomorrow, I'd like you to keep annotating on, on the document that you have sitting there. I would also love to see people in office hours to discuss the homework that I gave you before. If you have actually written something, which I hope you have, I would love to have that now. And I will look at it, and I will give you comments. <laughs>